Hi, everybody. I just want to get right to it. Let me please introduce our wonderful guest today. We have uh, Dave Patel, the star of the film, and Luke, da Luke Davies, the screenwriter. And then a special treat, we have the real-life Saru Brierly in-house. So please help join me in the So welcome to Google, guys. Hello. Thanks. How was your lunch? It's the first question. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great. Well, uh, some of the folks in the audience haven't had a chance to see the film yet, so I thought I could start with a question for you, Luke. Uh, maybe you could tell us about the film as well as tell us what attracted you to this particular story. Very simply, it's a true story about a <coughs> five-year-old boy. Uh, this is him now as an adult, and this is the guy who plays him as an adult, uh, who under very traumatic and calamitous circumstances one day gets lost on a train and winds up um, 2,000 kilometers away in Calcutta. Uh, after many scrapes, he winds up in an orphanage. He gets adopted by an Australian couple. He grows up in Australia. He loses his Hindi, his Hindi. And 25 years later, he learns of the existence of Google Earth. And he has about five memories in his head, visual memories from when he was five years old of his village. And he starts following the railway lines out of that train station where he arrived at Calcutta, this massive train station. Uh, and then more and more obsessively uh, following those railway lines, looking for uh, matches to these visual clues. And what attracted me to it was just that it's a magnificently pure and simple fable about um, reunification with the lost mother and maternal love and hope and persistence and love. It was, I just wanted to write this screenplay that was very simple and very powerful. Yeah, there's a lot of universal themes in the film. Great. Uh, Dave, my next question is for you. Uh, I had the honor of being at the Til TIFF premiere, yeah. where this film got a standing ovation, and I think it was the runner-up for the Audience Award. This film is resonating with audiences, and I was just curious, why do you think that is? What do you think about the film as causing people to really have this very visceral reaction to it? Um, I really think it's an anthem of uh, unity and humanity, really. Um, you know, it's, it's so triumphant at its core. It's a story about mothers and sons, and... Uh, you know, I think that's those themes are so universal, you know, and, um, you know, that's what you want to do when you go into this dark room. You want to be transported and inspired. And and, you know, the fact that, you know, we're breathing a second life into what is essentially a true story, which this young man here so bravely transversed is it makes it even more inspiring. Great. Thanks. Sorry. Um, so as a game we all play growing up, who would play you in a film? <laughs> and so, don't answer that. Yeah. <laughs> did Dave pull it off? Look, he did a uh, amazing job. Yeah, he, he has he has pulled it off. <laughs> that wasn't my real question. Oh. <laughs> uh, no, my real question is, um, you know, uh, you saw the film, I'm sh and you know, I, I'm curious about your reaction to seeing it. But more, how did it change your understanding of your own story? Having seen it dramatized in a film, did it change how you saw your own journey and your own uh, discovery of? Uh, birth parents? Um, it, it didn't really because um, I've lived, um, you know, and I've told my story, you know, so many times to my parents and myself, mm -hmm. um, sort of, you know, internally. And, um, but seeing it for the first time, I thought I'd be, you know, quite desensitised from it uh, because I've lived it. And, uh, but, I, but it wasn't like that at all. I was, um, I was just so sort of into it, um, clenching onto you know, my knees and, um, and you know, there was such pivotal times um, where it crescendoed the points where, you know, I had tears in, in myself as well. So, um, you know, the, the movie was just so true, you know, to my story, which is great. And, um, and yeah, it's just, um, and just looking at it, um, you know the way they've done everything was just amazing, and um, and it you know there's t there's auditorial talking about it, which I had been uh, for such a long time and been written in the book as well, but seeing it out um, and played out um, with Dev and and the others there too is um, it was just another sort of level I guess, um, which not only myself but my family got to see it too, my adoptive family, and um, and also you know people um, in the world too. What was it like to see it with your adopted family? Oh, look, <laughs> I look, well, 
because I used to tell him so many times, um, this is the events and the stages and phases that I went through um, in India, and uh, now they actually can see what it really is visually, um, and that visual um, sense got heightened uh, from your auditorial, and um, and they just broke down. You know, Dad just said we didn't really know. You know, even though you told us. Uh, what you went through, but seeing it was just a, another climax in your senses. And um, we all sort of, um, after seeing the movie, just um, sort of cuddled each other and, um, and um, yeah, for about 30 minutes. And um, it was just such a pivotal moment there of letting them actually see something that they hadn't, well, sort of been longing for such a long time. Did Nicole Kidman pull it off for your mum? She did an amazing job. She did. She it's did like an amazing that, job. That, uh, there's, a, there's a person, there's a, a specific scene where she tells us, uh, tells me, oh, tells you. Um, it's so massive. Right <laughs> we're now. the same, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> um, about, you know, being, um, you know, not having children where she states that, you know, they could actually have children but um, mum and dad collectively decided not to because they wanted to help someone that was more in need than sort of having children themselves. Great, thanks. Dave, next question for you. So as product manager of Google Earth, I have to have one question about it. Uh, and it's uh, generally when you see technology in films, computers, they're generally a foil or a prop, mm. where I think what's nice about this film, what's especially touching to me, is you brought this product to life. And I think it's through your acting and your reacting to the product. And I was just curious, what was the process to really kind of bring this to life and have that Thank you, thank you for that. Well, um, I've said this before, but I've spent a lot of my career staring in front of all these scenes, uh, uh, these screens, you know, pretending to, you know, gather all this information and run to a character that's more important than myself. And, you know, I'm playing a, a plethora of, um, you know, tech-centric guys. But, you know, the, the interesting thing about this is, uh, you know, I'm sitting in front of this laptop and it's an entirely emotional experience, that relationship with technology that uh, Saru has. You know, he's looking at this screen, he's looking at those blurry pixels, which is what it was back in the day, you know, the refresh rates and the, it, it wasn't as developed as it is now. Mm -hmm. And he's drawing so much history, so much pain, so much um, memory from these these pixels. So it was kind of some of the hardest stuff I've ever had to do, you know, uh, as a performer. And uh, oh. it's, it's really validating, you know, to finally be able to sit in front of a screen and uh, feel like you're doing something of uh, real gravitas. Yeah. I heard you got Google Earth training lessons too. I did. I did. <laughs> It was in the schedule. I think it was twice a week I had to sit Excellent. down. And you, you helped with the program. You gave us the, a little bit. the right... Yeah. A little bit, yeah. I just uh, made It's period uh, perfect, yeah. Yeah, just one small detail that I think is really... Why I love the feel it's so authentic is, um, you know, Google Earth right now, we've launched version 7. But when they were in the film, they were using 4 and 5. Uh, and we had to do some archaeology to find those old versions, make sure they worked on laptops. And if you watch the film very carefully, the first time he uses it, it's Earth 4. The second time he uses it, or later in the film, it's Earth Pro 5, which is just to say these filmmakers paid a lot of attention to detail, and, all, and it's very authentic that way. Nothing, nothing that they did with the product or you know, with really anything in the film, I think, took unnecessary liberties, and that's why part of the reason I think it's so powerful is that authenticity. Um, Luke, so we talked a little bit about this, uh, about uh, these universal themes of home, mothers and sons, finding your own identity. And what other pieces of art, books, movies, um, art inspired you or did you draw from to kind of tell this universal story? You called it a fable earlier. Were there other? Very, very <coughs> specifically, the, uh, the first act of the film where, where it's the five-year-old uh, actor Sonny Poor, who plays Saru as the five-year-old who gets lost. Um, my model for that first hour of the film really was um, is Wally, <coughs> is the is the robot wandering around the post-apocalyptic kind of environment, um, and so I wanted to kind of create something of the texture of the feeling of the first act of Wally, -E, which I find a really emotional first hour. I, that film, for me, changes direction slightly when it gets up into space. It's suddenly a bit of a different yeah. tonal world. So uh, that was my big influence for the first part of the film. The rest of it was just trying to find a way of telling this extremely emotionally heart-breaking and heart-wrenching story um, and to make... My aim was basically to see 
if I'm sitting in the in the theater and I can hear people crying around me, I feel great. <laughs> The, there, and this is a, a, a multiple Kleenex kind of film. Absolutely. And the first time we screened it here for Googlers, there was a lot of ugly crying in front of coworkers. <laughs> uh, so, Saru, um, what, what is the message that you want people to take away from this film when they see it? What do you hope is communicated by it and they take away from seeing your story dramatized? Well, um, well, you read the book, and I guess you know it'd be sort of the same as um, watching the movie as well. That I think you know at the end of the day, it's a, it's a powerful movie uh, to individuals, uh, no matter who you are, really, and what sort of state of frame of mind you um, you be at the end of it. But um, really, at the end of the day, it'd be sort of a empowerment um, of understanding, um, and, and you know knowing that there is actually a way if you were sort of ever to be in a position that I was in, um, perhaps these are the kind of things that you could use from, you know, extracting, extrapolating from your memories um, how to sort of find your way home, whether, you know, it's from people from the war or um, people from different countries. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really think, you know, that's sort of the, the main thing out there as well as you know there's other things as well as in like you know love and um and family and you know unification um and you can just sort of talk about it in sort of so many different ways from political to social um to a sort of a um a whole heap of other things but um i think that's the main one really um that there must be other people out there uh -huh. that have been in the same situation but just haven't been able to sort of you know understand what their feelings and you know their dreams are telling them and this is a, this is a story that you know when you've been dreaming for something that you know it means that you've been longing for it and you must suppress it diffuse it somehow and uh, and, and listen to it and that's what i did i i had it for such a long time these memories and um when I came to, you know, when I was 27, 28, um, I, I, I didn't know what to do, but I sort of used my, you know, the feelings and the dreams and all that and, um, and you know, went out and um, did what I did. Uh -huh. um, because otherwise, if you don't, it's just going to stick with you for such a long time. And, um, and before you know it, you're maybe too old <laughs> um, to do anything about it. But, you know, you certainly got to listen to your heart and your dreams, they mean something. Do you remember the exact moment that you learned about Google Earth? Um, when, I was, uh, when I was at um, school at the Canberra University there, that's, that's when I um, sort of uh, got in touch with it because someone was talking about it. Uh, was it 2005, late 2005, 2006? That's when Google first launched yeah. in 2005. Yeah, so that's, you know, for me, Google Earth was embryonic. Um, when I was in my early sort of 20s, um, when I looked at the map in my bedroom, I was like, you know, I can't find my hometown using the map because I can't find Kandwa. Uh, well, I didn't know it back then. I can't find Burrampur. Um, But the visual memories that I have, I thought to myself back then in my early 20s that there must be or will be a program later in the future they'll come out that I could use those memories. And it evidentially has happened, Google Earth. Yeah, that's great. A um, Couple more questions, but then I'm gonna turn it over to audience questions. So if you guys wanna start to think of questions and uh, start to line up, I think they'll set up the mic in the back. Um, so uh, Dave, my next question is for you. I was uh, looking at your IMDb page <laughs> and looking at some of the films that you've made. Whoops. And <laughs> be gentle, no. <laughs> please. <laughs> Okay, we won't talk about those early films. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, there's an interesting theme that happens in a few of your films, Slumdog, The Man Who Knew Infinity, and, of course, Lion, as a character leaves their home to discover their destiny and then comes back. Maybe that's how I'm looking at it. And you actually have um, an interesting sort of ancestry where your ancestors are from India, your parents grew up in Nairobi, and then you grew up in London and now reside in the States. So with all of these things, what does home mean to you now? You, know, you have characters that have discovered it in different ways in your own life. How is home redefined? How is home redefined? Uh, 
God, that's interesting. I do, I do gravitate towards uh, the idea of a fish out of water. Mm. You know, I can relate to that. You know, you know, going to school, I was never really popular or anything like that. So I always felt like a a bit of an outsider looking in at times. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I, I left home when I was sixteen. You know, to, and discovered India, shooting this film Slumdog for the first time, and it was uh, completely eye-opening experience. It was part of my heritage that I had shunned growing up for a long time so I could fit in, be normal, be be like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And when I went there and witnessed this city with this amazing Bombay, this, uh, Mumbai, this amazing filmmaker, Danny Ball, you know, you're seeing things, you know, going into the slums and, you know, just just in, in, incredible, incredible things. It, it kind of um, opened up my mind to a higher level of consciousness, I guess. And, uh, you know, I've gone back since and done five films, but, you know, home to me, I have a fascination with trees. This sounds very hippie. So just stick with me here. But I, I, I uh, whenever I go to a hotel or something, I'll draw a little tree. It looks like a piece of broccoli, but that's the best thing. And then I write grow next to it and I sign it and leave it. on. All. And the idea of it is, uh, you know, home is the roots to me. Mm. And the roots are so important because if they're, you know, that's where the tree gets its nourishment, its strength, mm -hmm. and uh, it's 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 grounding. And from there, with good roots and a knowledge of home and a connection to it, you can grow on, you know, grow into this mighty tree bearing fruits. Absolutely. And and I know it sounds crazy, but you know that's my idea of it. And I I feel my parents. Everybody, like who, everybody who works on Google Earth is a hippie, so <laughs> you're, you're in good company. Yeah. So did uh, that answer? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that was a beautiful. I asked a hard question. Um, so last question is actually for all of you, and it comes from uh, our followers on social media. So we posted a question, what would you like to ask you guys? And the question um, is, what was the most exciting or inspiring scene for each of you in the film? And if other folks want to start lining up for questions, please feel free. Well, you wrote it. Hey, it's based on you, so... I mean, <laughs> well, who, I'm going to say wants all to of first. it, but, um, but yeah. <laughs> um, I love the scene where... Uh, <clears throat> where he, Dev comes to see Sue, his mother, played by Nicole Kidman, and um, and he finds out that they chose not to have kids, that she could have had kids, but they chose to help kids who were already alive. Mm -hmm. I really like that scene a lot. Mm. I have to agree there too. Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty special. I had a front row seat to Nicole Kidman just pouring her soul out. And, yeah. uh, you know, she really performed from the gut in that. But, uh, yeah, that's... I mean, all of it for me was completely profound you know as a i grew up in the process filming the movie you know and 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 garth is one of those directors that allows you to really be open and exposed mm. but uh am i allowed to talk about the end is that even yeah. you know i mean i don't know but uh there, there's so many but um you know one that the end you know you should watch but it's very <laughs> it's, i think They've seen it. They've seen. It. Can enough, I enough? That? Enough of them have seen it. They're enough of them seen it. But that scene uh, is as real as it gets. You know, I, I that was the first thing I shot in the film. So I flew out to 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 India, and uh, Garth was like, you know, as a little sperm, you were swimming up to this moment. So don't mess <laughs> it up. I was like, okay, no pressure then. Um, but you know, it, it's terrifying because you know, so much rides on this moment of unity, right. and. Uh, we get there and we start filming and me and Priyanka, who plays the Indian mother, she's an incredible actress and there's not much to do in the kind of location that we were filming at. So every night we would all be having dinners and things and he's like, you can't see her now for a week before we shoot this. Mm. And the next time I saw her was in the scene. So this, this man was like, wait a second and he goes away, comes back and I start following him through these alleyways and I come out to this opening and then at the end of the you know, f far in the distance, I can see these three figures and they start approaching me and we're getting closer. And I start to recognize it's Priyanka. And they've done this incredible makeup on her face to age her. And, uh, you know, uh, all these, there was no planted extras. You know, all those people in the village were, were real villagers. Mm. They didn't understand what I was saying, um, but they could feed off that energy, the truth. And, um, by the end of it, I felt like I was in Avatar because we're embracing, we're crying. It's a moment of complete joy and um, sadness also. And, um, you know, that all these hands just start reaching out and feeling my face and touching me. And you look around and they're crying with you and laughing with you. And uh, 
it was, yeah, it was a really special moment. Yeah. I think that's a great start. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I also, I love, speak, because we're here, I love, in terms of the technology of the film, I love that moment right near the end where you're pretty much giving up, where you zoom out fully up mm. through India and, and the whole of the planet is just like hovering there in space at this final moment before you start to zoom back in. Yeah. That moment to me is like, <gasps> hairs on the back of my neck, really. The sound design at that, where they make you feel hollow, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. All right, great. Well, we have some audience questions. Uh, so let's start with the first one, please. I want to thank you for the film. I saw it um, a couple days ago, and I don't remember the last time I cried at a film. Uh -huh. <laughs> thank you. My, my question is, is what happened to your mother uh, in India? What, what's up with her now? Oh, um, she's good. She's healthy. So is my brothers and sisters. Um, and, uh, and I bought her a house. Um, because before she was uh, renting a house, and so <laughs> one of <it's laughs> um, and, and the house was you know the house that she's been living in. She didn't want to sort of move away to anywhere else uh, because her friends were you know within that sort of vicinity of the house. Um, so she she just wanted that house, and I sort of put some money in you know every month just to sort of help her out, and um, she doesn't have to really work anymore. Um, but but she's good. Like she's probably fitter than me, really. Um, <laughs> amazing woman, so strong mentally and physically. And um, yeah, I think I've got good traits. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no wrinkles, million dollar ones. Um, and um, and yeah, so I'm really happy. She's about 63, 64 years of age. Um, and um, but she's just doing really right, like great. And we talk just about. Um, every month um, through a translator. So, and is I've seen her about Kandwa? 14 times. She's still in Kandwa? That's where the yes. house is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So she's still there um, in the same house. Um, so I'm, I'm really fortunate actually um, that um, she's got good health. So that's great. Great. Hey guys, uh, I'm John. I'm on the Google Earth Outreach team. And I wanted to ask Rue, if you could go back in time to 2005 when you first discovered Google Earth, there was one feature you could add that would have made your journey easier. Off the records, I tried to crack it <laughs> and <laughs> kind of penetrate into Google. Um, yeah, a bit of hacking, but it was, wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> um, That's okay, we know all about it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I had a shield. It didn't, didn't work. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't, I'm not too sure really. I think everything just happened the way it meant to happen. My destiny was meant to happen that way. But, um, but I, I think if the clarity of, um, you know, Google Earth back then was a lot better, then the whole search would have been you know, a lot easier, as well as the speed, the refresh rates and so on. But funny thing about it is that, you know, that version of Google Earth, when I saw my hometown, I would have been the only person in this world hmm. that knew where those landmarks were and what, and, um, what they were as well. And for a normal person that were looking at, you know, something that I was looking at uh, on Google Earth zooming down back then, um, they would have gone, what is that? It just looks like a bush. But no, to me, I could tell them right down to the grassroots what it is. Yeah. And that's how sort of, you know, vivid my memories were. So I, I guess, you know, if it was a little bit more, the clarity, the resolution would have been better. It would have helped. It sounds like what was meant to be happened. So. Well, that's right. You know, um, the children that came out of the, the ESA, which is the Indian Society of Sponsorship and Adoption, um, I, I just think we're all destiny's child and we m carve out and make what the future is for ourselves. So things were meant to be the way they were. It, that's, that's how it was meant to be then. Thanks. Thank you guys so much for being here with us today. Um, Saru, I wanted to ask you, there's no way to collapse decades of your rich life into a book or into a movie. Um, so I was wondering if there's any events or relationships or nuances of your life that maybe didn't make it into the public eye that you might be able to share with us. <laughs> well, it's it's a massive story. Um, I, I think there's you know there, there's quite a few sort of events um, and stages, phases of the 
the whole journey um, right from inception that could have been in there. But um, all great, you know, all great raw data. Um, but um, I think the sort of the main, you know, ones um, you guys sort of pick pretty well, um, especially um, Luke there, who's a script writer. Um, I think uh, one of them would have been The Drowning um, in the river, in the Hooghly River. Um, you want to tell a little bit about that story for people who don't know? Oh, okay. So, actually, they did put it in there, but... It was in an early draft of the script yeah. and then so, we had to lose it. Yeah, and The Drowning of the Hooghly River, I'll tell you about it and what it is. I didn't know how to swim, but I love the water. And the Hooghly River has a tidal system, and I didn't understand that. I was only a kid. And um, and I was jumping off a ledge onto a, sorry, a step onto another step, and I was having so much fun that I didn't realise that I was going step by step by step, even by the to the point where there was no step at the end of that step right down the bottom because the tide had sort of gone down. And, um, and I jumped in and, um, and the tide, and, and there was no bottom. And um, I didn't know how to swim. The rips got me and I'm, just, and I'm just like going down. And then up, down, up for a couple of times. And then the last time I just took the tiniest bit of breath and I was just going down to the abyss. And I thought, you know, that's the end of me. And I saw the light, the sun sort of dim more and more and more. And I put my hand up and the only thing that I could think of at that point of time was my mother and my sister. And I just thought to myself, I hope they're okay, even though I'm about to sort of go. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this hand, this angel, this hand just came in, grabbed me out and, um, and yeah, <laughs> it was, that, was, that was the most amazing bit. Such a powerful you know, point of time. Whose hand was it? Um, it was um, it was just a guy, from, um, one of the store workers that actually somehow had noticed this kid, you know, his hands coming up and down, um, bobbing up and down. Um, and um, if it was any longer, then I would have been gone. So it was a great scene. One of the reasons that had to go was just because it would have been a, a super expensive day with safety officers, underwater cameras, uh, health and safety issues that were extremely problem problematic in that river in terms of insurance. It would have been a gnarly day shooting and it would have cost a lot of money. So, But there were other reasons too why in the end it went. It's a, it's a beautiful moment. I don't think I could have cried one more time in the film, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but th that would have been like, you could almost think that, oh, from the audience point of view, um, oh, he's gone, you know, yeah. the story ends there. But um, it's amazing, you know, what, what's out there really. Um, I, I'm very fortunate actually. Very You're a survivor, fun. man. Yeah. yeah. Please. Hi, um, this one's for Luke. What was the process like turning the book into a script? Like how do you choose the important moments? Because there's a lot of material, right? For me, I... I just always tried to keep in mind that this story was about this very singular emotional journey towards wholeness. All the rest of it was just uh, frills and trappings, including the technology. The technology had to only service uh, Saru's emotional story. Um, technically, the process was I had a previous relationship with the producers. They said, have you heard this story about this Indian kid who got lost? And that was the week that the story had been floating around because the book had just come out. And I had heard the story. Uh, I kind of auditioned for the job. I, wrote a I, I read the book quickly. I wrote a structure of how I would approach the film. The main big thing was that from the very beginning, I said to them, this story is so powerful and so amazing. Do you mind if I try to write the first draft of the screenplay? We don't do the typical thing and begin with your star adult actors and establish them and their world. And then something happens. And then you loop back and tell the story and come back to where you were. Let's try and begin at the beginning with a five-year-old actor. At the moment, he steps on the train and gets lost. Uh, and they, they were really supportive of that. So it always had a very linear structure. Um, the process was just trying to find the biggest emotional storylines that made, gave the story a really good beginning, middle, and end. And that when you reach the end, you feel a sort of, I would call it a kind of triumphant, exhilarating sadness if the film works. It's both sad and extremely hopeful and triumphant. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Salim. I'm on the Google Earth Outreach team. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm particularly interested in, in your perspectives on storytelling. Storytelling has been, for thousands of years, a way to raise awareness and um, bring community together. And through, you know, and I think the, the, the methods have changed over time, and technology is certainly at an at a interesting place, from my perspective, now of, of enabling maybe the same, maybe different types of stories. Can you talk a little bit about how you see storytelling changing or changed over time, and maybe going forward from the perspective of how technology can help or plays, plays a role there? Well, I think that the technology changes constantly, and that's, that's just something to be embraced. But the stories, I think, remain extreme. The, the great stories remain really uh, prim primitive, uh, not primitive, but primal and elementary. Uh, no, elemental, that's the word. Um, and this one for me, I just imagined that the story of reunification with the lost mother, this basically has to be one of the oldest stories in the, history, in the emotional history of human civilization. It's got to be as old as it can possibly get fr from the origins of our uh, civilization, reunification with the lost mother. There's no, no kind of more powerful force, I think, than maternal love and, the, and uh, a story about the, the loss and deprivation of maternal love is really... Um, it's full of peril, and that's hopefully what drives this film. Please. Yes, and um, and also Google Earth and um, and how it's being used. That's technology, mm -hmm. which um, which which is the other part of the story too. Is that you know when I when I'm doing my search, how am I going to use these memories in my head, uh, and by using technology which is out there and no one's really thinking about it. Um, but I am. It's like, you know, it's this application um, out there and uh, a lot of people, you know, that I hear just use it to look at their houses. I mean, I did myself. Um, <laughs> rooftop. <laughs> but um, but it's, it's just that, um, that idea that's just crystallised in your head as in like this application could be utilised for my own personal benefits. And, um, and, you know, when I did use that, idea and, and thank god you know google earth did come when it did um otherwise if it wasn't there for me then i don't think we'd be here sort of talking yeah, it's true uh dave actually maybe we, you could take a crack at that question where storytelling fits into the world we live in today and what purpose it serves in society i mean i think it's the the highest form of escapism you know there is you know um i I yeah th I mean I I that's something that really I connected to as a young child was going in and watching films it shaped the way I think my ideals everything about the way I see the world so um for me you know especially when you go to India and see what their movie stars mean to them hmm. you know you know there's a, a population there you know that is below the poverty line a very high part of the population and that that type of cinema is so well catered to these massives you know, it's the perfect form of escapism, the dancing, the colors, the you know, big spectacle. And, uh, you know, I mean, that cinema is changing, but for me, it's just, it's an inspiration. You know, it provides hope and yeah, you know, in terms of technology, I guess, uh, it's becoming simpler to be able to tell stories now. You know, people are telling, shooting movies on their phones now, you're capable of doing that. Uh, you need less and less people and, you know, the equipment's getting smaller and more powerful. So it's making it easier uh, and more accessible to a wider range of people to be able to go in and shoot a film. You know, we shot some of the scenes in Slumdog on a little Canon camera. Like, I think it was like 45 frames per second and you blend them together and it creates, it's slightly jumpy, but that's what Danny used as the memory, the flashbacks. And it creates like a real visceral color and a kind of dreamlike quality to stuff. But, uh, you know, with, with less money, you make, money makes you more adaptable and uh, good things come from that. So that's what happened in that situation. But anyway. Thanks. Next question. Oh, hi, I'm Grace. Um, I recently just joined the Google marketing team. Um, and I was just wondering, like, from your guys' perspective, since you all played such a different kind of role and had different perspectives and experiences interacting with the story, um, what particularly surprise you the most in terms of what you learned or something that you didn't expect um, to happen or discover? Um, could you just share that insight with us? Wow. 
They don't ask easy questions around here. I know, man. Ah. <laughs> uh. That's hard. What did what was something I learned that I didn't ex a discovery that I didn't expect? I'm, I might take. A, I need to think go about that it. for a minute. No. Hey, oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Saru, go for it, man. No, you don't need you go for it. I'm, I'm just like uh, we're all stumped. Oh, yeah, you got us. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, actually, I, I, I didn't really know. You know, I, I did what I did, and then all of a sudden, all these things just uh, I never envisaged all this to come about. And uh, for me, I'm just taking it, you know, a step at a time. And uh, even though everything has expedited so much from, um, you know, finding my family to all of a sudden the news going global um, to a book to a movie and then a stage show as well. Um, you know, about a year ago, I was still processing that I've done something so amazing, yeah. which is to find my family. And that's something just doesn't, you know, gets diffused, the weight off your shoulders just like that. And I think it's just being, you know, in time that will sort of hit me that, um, you know, you've done something incredible and, you know, um, you should be proud of it. So, and I am, so, but it's just taking time because there's so many other things. Um, but, yeah, to answer your question, that's sort of how I feel at the moment. Yeah, I mean, as an actor, I kind of feel like I've grown so much, you know. It's hard with someone that looks like me to get um, such a diverse, meaty journey to go on roles. So, you know, this has been a beautiful journey because, you know, there's this this young man here who's risen through so much adversity and uh, has been generous and brave enough to share this story to the world. And then there takes a talented team like Garth, our director, and Luke, you know, to bring it even further and, and closer and breathe life into it. And then I, you know, I get to step on and put the icing on the cake, but uh, it, it's really been a, a, a journey of exploration. What I have learned, which it comes up at the end of the film is, uh, you know, 80,000 children, you know, go missing every year in India. That I did not know. I did not know the scale of, uh, of, of this situation that we want to talk about. You know, and, uh, you know, films like this can allow this conversation to happen, you know. And, you know, if it changes the life of one child, then, you know, we've, you know, the, it makes it all worthwhile, you know. But uh, this is a recurring problem and, you know, hopefully we can bring light into this situation. I, I do, I remember a discovery, uh, an amazingly funny moment. <clears throat> so there's the scene in the middle of the film where Little Sonny's walking along, he finds a spoon in the ground and there's a funeral going on. There's a little boy being carried along on an open uh, thing by a bunch of men <clears throat> and they're all chanting. And so the producers in India, they were doing all the casting stuff for that day's shoot. They were like, we need 15 men and we need uh, the dead 11-year-old boy. And the, uh, one of the casting companies comes back and they're like, we're all good with the 15 men. We're having a bit of trouble with the 11-year-old boy. And the producers are like, what are you talking about? And they're like, well, the police permissions, it's really difficult to find a dead 11-year-old boy. <laughs> wow. That's, so that's something new. <laughs> Next question, please. Hi, guys. Thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing the story. Um, I have a six-year-old son. It struck a big chord for me cried the whole time, you'd be happy. Um, <laughs> my question, Saru, is for you. The scene in the movie where you are taken in by a woman and it seems great. It seems like she's warm and it's a safe place and then you started feeling like it wasn't and then you left, you escaped. How, as a five-year-old, being by yourself like that, did you navigate those situations and instinctually know not to stay with her? Th that particular scene um, with Rama, um, who's the guy that came in, that tipped it off because um, I had a gut feeling um, that, you know, as a child, that's what happened. You know, I just didn't feel that the situation was right. Um, it was more wrong than anything else. So um, that's how really it sort of um, came about that, you know, th they're not really here to help me. Um, the guy, you know, things were a bit too close with a, it's, you know, whichever way it's going to sort of go. But, you know, I didn't want to find that out, which way I was going to go. So I made the valiant attempt to run off and, you know, maybe they were going to help me. But, 
Um, but my gut feelings told me, no, this is wrong and you need to get out. And so I did. Amazing. Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks for coming. I first just want to acknowledge your point about the drowning scene. I actually haven't seen the movie yet, so I didn't know that was cut. And I thought that was profound in the book because it just reminds me about how life is a combination of your your personal tenacity. Obviously, your story is pretty much all about <laughs> your personal tenacity. But then those moments of sheer luck and guardian angels or whatever it may be that combined with um, your intent to get to get you to where you are. So, Anyway, it was interesting to hear you talk about that. My question, however, is really about what compelled you to write a book? And especially, you know, given it's an autobiographical, I just kind of am always in awe of people who feel compelled to put their story in writing for public consumption. Well, um, I actually got asked to write a book from uh, four publishing companies. Um, not, actually, not that I actually went out there and um, asking to write a story about this because it was so personal, but... Um, but the thing about it is that um, it just went sort of um, snowballed in India, you know, everywhere in India when I first, you know, found my family. And uh, from India, you know, went to sort of Australia and then the whole world. And um, that's when, you know, sort of publishers um, got hold of, well, knew about the story and got in contact. And so I had a choice of, um, you know, sort of telling my story, which in fact has been out, you know, it's out already. Didn't, I did have a choice of like not telling it and sort of have, keeping it private, but I thought, you know, what I did is just so unique, profound and amazing, and if it could help someone else, um, that's been, like I said before, my situation, and that's, well, that's gold for me. Um, and so I grabbed the bull by the horns and, um, and I decided, yeah, I'll, I'll write a book about it, and, um, and, you know, the process started, and here it is now. Thank you. One more question. Okay. Okay. Hey, um, I really enjoyed the movie. I thought it did a really good job of showing complexity and I think um, of the situation. And, and at the end, you feel grateful, but you also feel this heaviness that that there's just it's a complex story. And I think you you all really pulled it off really well. And my question is for Saru. There's this point in the um, in the movie where you you know you go to the the, the um, you eat Indian food, and you're at, and you're at, and you, and you kind of it hits you, and these memories come back. And so my question is really, it's very, I find memories very interesting, and kind of, I was really curious in leaving the film, did those memories haunt you, or, as you grew up, or and did you carry them with you, or did they suddenly come back to you and you couldn't resist them? Um, good question, actually, and um, and the reason for those. Um, I guess it's called um, a juxtaposing, where you're living now and then all of a sudden you get a flashback. And that's what they were. They were, they were flashbacks. And the way that flashbacks were triggered was um, the scene with the jellyby. Um, and the ones that are not in the movie would be uh, – a flashback would be triggered by, um, I would see, you know, a family – um, in Australia, even though I've got my own, you know, adoptive family there, I would see other families there and that have, you know, their two, their nuclear family, they have, the, you know, two kids and the mother and father and all of a sudden just seeing that, I, I'm, I'd be in a sort of straight of frame of mind of, um, you know, sort of just, you know, sort of wondering about my, you know, my past life and that just by looking at that would trigger things and I would sort of remember you know, what it was like for myself um, as a child to be playing with my sister running around my mum's leg in her sari and, you know, playing sort of um, um, hide and seek. So, um, so that, you know, that was one of the things that sort of stayed with me by these trigger points and there was multiples of them um, and, you know, that, that made it sort of um, sustained and that's why I probably also, you know, didn't lose those memories as well as sort of my dreams as well during the night too. So, um, but, you know, there, there was times where where you sort of, you know, you, you just didn't know what to do with it. Sometimes you just fell in a heap and, um, and cried about it, you know, in your personal self. Um, and, you know, there was also things that songs that, that would trigger memories as well, multiples of them. 
and and you'd always and sometimes there was times where you just have just a whole heap of just memories go flick 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 all within sort of sort of thirty seconds, um, almost like you know you know when you see Predator. I don't want to go that far, but <laughs> where here's that choo, choo kind of yeah, and that's how it was. Yeah. Um, but you know multiples of them. So um, and yeah, it's just you know memories like that. I, I, I'm sort of glad that it was like that because it's sustained in my memory, um, and um, and I suppose maybe there was a reason for that that stayed there. I was meant to do something, you know, later on, but I just hadn't worked out. Just hadn't worked out at that point of time. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, and thank you guys for your wonderful, honest answers. I think this was a great session. And uh, if you haven't seen the film, please do. It's a beautiful film. And uh, yeah, thanks, everyone.